Okay, good morning. I'm Pete Daly, CEO and publisher of the U.S. Naval Institute, and I'd like to start by thanking the Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Mike Gilday, for continuing this CNO Naval History Essay Contest now in its sixth year and making the commitment to uh, present the awards in person. Um, it's easy for active duty sea service professionals to get caught up in their busy schedules and think, well, this history thing is just something I do later when I have more time to read a book. But it's not. The history of the Navy, the Marine Corps, and the Coast Guard is vital to who we are and forms more. our traditions and our culture and informs the way we train and fight. Stories of Medal of Honor recipients provide inspiring examples of ordinary people doing the extraordinary. They remind us of what it means to serve and that we stand on the shoulders of giants. Studying history reminds me that we aren't the only leaders who have faced hard choices. In my experience, all too often when a crisis occurs with a seemingly unique set of challenges, the first thing you hear is, well, this has never happened before. Uh, or we're sailing into completely uncharted territory. And next time you feel like that's something's never happened before, I invite you to look at the archive of Naval Institute Proceedings articles that we've digitized back. You can search them all the way back to 1874. And I dare say there's a really good chance that your new problem is, is somewhere, somewhere in there. Uh, the Naval Institute's been conducting essay contests for 120 years. And future leaders have entered and won these contests, including Alfred Thayer Mahan, Ernest J. King, right up into the present, people like Admiral Sandy Winnefeld and Admiral Jim Stavridis. And uh, they survived. And we're always pleased to see young active duty authors leading the way in our essay contest. And this year exemplifies that because uh, for our four active duty winners are all in the grade of 05 and below. They dared to think, they dared to write, and they dared to submit their essays. I especially want to thank General Dynamics for its generous support of this essay contest. In particular, I'd like to acknowledge Phoebe Novakovic, the CEO, and the EVP for Marine Systems, Rob Smith. They've been with us every step of the way on this contest. And so it's now my pleasure to introduce Rear Admiral Retired Sam Cox as the 14th Director of Naval History and Curator of the Navy He's responsible for all aspects of the Navy's official history programs. We've been pleased to work with him in partnership on this contest since the beginning. Sam Cox, thank you. Hi, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for being here this morning. Uh, you know, one of the lessons of, of history besides uh, never get involved in a land war in Asia is uh, don't upstage the CNO. So I'll keep this very short. I just want to thank, uh, in particular, uh, Pete Daly and the Naval Institute for being extraordinary partners uh, in this uh, Naval History competition. Uh, when CNO Richardson uh, disestablished the uh, CNO Strategic Studies Group, this contest was envisioned as part of that replacement for uh, that process in order to bring in outside ideas that, you know, based on history that can go to the CNO. So he tasked me to create a contest and, and a conference. Uh, I was able to talk him out of the conference because we got McMullen every two years and this great conference here. And uh, for far the contest, my first thought was, well, partner with the Naval Institute. By the time I called Pete Daly, he'd already heard about it and was already volunteering. So this was a you know match made in heaven based on uh, their 100 plus years of, of doing these contests. So Pete, again, thank you very much. And I particularly also want to thank the judges uh, for the contest. Uh, they came from institutions all over the country, War College, Postgraduate School, Annapolis, uh, several different colleges. Uh, but thank you for their if, you know for their uh, time uh, in doing this. Uh, I do want to thank a couple members of, of my staff, uh, Dr. Pete Haynes, uh, Denise uh, Krepp, and uh, Lieutenant J.G. Josh Hanno, uh, who did a, a heck of a lot of work in helping to put this contest together. Uh, and finally, I want to especially thank uh, CNO Gilday uh, for his extraordinary support of naval history. 
Uh, I've been blessed to be in this job for eight years now and I've had incredible support from four sec navs and four CNOs. Uh, and we've had a string of successes lately. We brought Nautilus uh, out of dry dock for the first time in 30 years uh, on time and under budget. We have a new uh, operational archive, library, and research center also on time and, and under budget. Uh, and the SECNAV just announced publicly that we're building a new National Museum in the United States Navy. Uh, none of that would have been possible without the support of the CNO, particularly Admiral Gilday. So thank you very much. And with that, let me uh, introduce, it is my honor to introduce uh, the Chief Naval Operations, uh, Admiral Michael Gilday. Good morning. Thank you for thank you for your kind words, um, Admiral Daly. Uh, your words remind me that if you somebody once told me if you want to learn something, pick up an old book. And so many times I find myself reading an old book off the shelf. Uh, you know your bookshelves at home. There, those books are your friends. You know it's tough to give them up. And uh, every once in a while you find yourself going back and diving back in um, on a Saturday afternoon. And um, anyway, I really. Uh, it, it's a pleasure to be here, and, and quite honestly, uh, it's an honor uh, to be part of this. Uh, my predecessor, uh, Admiral Richardson, began this contest, and uh, I think it's my duty to continue it, um, but it's also a real pleasure to do so as well. And the folks that have uh, invested intellectual capital in, um, in writing and thinking about the Navy and the Marine Corps and the maritime services, um, that work is put to good use. It really informs me and others in terms of the decisions that we make, um, some of them consequential. So for all who have participated in this, and for those of you that support them and read their work, thank you. Admiral Daly, Admiral Cox, and to everybody in this incredible Naval Institute, the Naval History and Heritage Command, thank you for organizing this essay contest and this ceremony and I know that there are many invisible hands that make this event possible. So my sincere thanks to all of you who have worked so hard behind the scenes to make this event a success. Let me also take a moment up front to join the chorus uh, and thank the judging committee, the, Na the historians from the Naval Institute and the United States Naval Academy, the Naval War College, the Naval Postgraduate School, and Navy uh, History and Heritage Command and our own staff, uh, Navy staff at the Pentagon. They've all made some outstanding selections for this year's awards. Thank you for your expertise. Thank you for your time and your support. And to our award winners and their families, congratulations on a truly impressive achievement. As I was preparing my marks uh, this weekend, somebody gave me uh, an essay written by the American historian Arthur Schlesinger Jr. entitled, the challenge of change. In thinking about the accelerating rate of technological change that continues to profoundly shape our world, Schlesinger argued that we must not underestimate the importance of history, which allows us to draw sustenance and wisdom from the past. Science and technology, Schlesinger wrote, revolutionize our lives, but memory and tradition, they frame our response. The past helps explain where we are today and how we got here. And I would add where we might be heading, for often what is past is prologue. So, as a Navy, even as we strive for modernization, invention, and innovation in weapon systems and platforms and in sensors, it is equally important that we study our history and that we remember our heritage. For there, will, for there we will find inspiration, we will find instruction, and we will find enlightenment. We're finding excellence lies not just in technical mastery, but also in historical literacy and institutional memory. This imperative is what brings us together today. As you all know, the purpose of this essay contest is to engage and to leverage the intellectual talents of the members of the United States Maritime Services to provide insights to catalyze discussion 
and to apply lessons from history on how, can, how we can establish and maintain maritime superiority in an age of strategic competition. This year's winners, they've done exactly that. And in the best traditions of historical analysis, their essays engage us in conversation between the past and the future so that what has already occurred can prepare us for what might come. Allow me to share with you some of the insights we gained from their writing. Lieutenant Colonel Owens reminds us that during World War II, Marine Corps aviation played a significant role as a land-based fleet air component, helping clear the way for naval forces to gain sea control. So, as Colonel Owens reminds us, when the Commandant announced in 2018 that Marines will focus on defending key maritime terrain that enables persistent sea control and denial operations, he was re really bringing, returning the Corps to the kinds of missions Marine aviation has historically played. In his essay, Just in Time Production, Commander Wright warns us that World War II as World War II fades further into the past, we risk developing a dangerous misperception about our triumph over Japan. The narrative that emerged is the story of, of American industry, awakened by an attack on Pearl Harbor, producing an unstoppable military juggernaut. However, Commander Wright reminds us that the ships that fought in the Battle of Coral Sea, the Guadalcanal campaign, and at the Battle of Midway included three aircraft carriers, Yorktown, Enterprise, and Hornet. And they were all built as part, of our, as part of our peacetime Navy in the 1930s, even as our nation was struggling through the Great Depression. The lesson for today's peacetime Navy are clear, that we can build now or we can pay later. Major Nicholson, he draws from lessons from the 1942 Solomon Islands campaign and the 1982 Falkland Islands campaign to provide insight on how we could prevail in a conflict in the first island chain today. First, he suggests that Americans need the allies and partners who allow the first island chain to become a maritime perimeter that constrains the PRC by offering American forces a home team advantage through access and integration. Secondly, we should capitalize on this advantage by building forts, land-based positions on key terrain from which to project power and enable sea control at decisive points at decisive times. Third, we must establish a trusted scouting network to efficiently and effectively close the kill chain. As Major Nicholson suggests, the first island chain is the front line of maritime strategic competition with the PRC, and we should be thoughtful about the strategic role that that important geography plays. Let me note that, that Major Nicholson could not be here today because he is actually out there on the front lines in Okinawa with 3MEF. His father, Dr. Nigel Nicholson, will receive the award on his son's behalf. Dr. Nicholson, Thank you for being here today. Thank you for your service in the United States Army, and thank you for raising such a terrific son. The two other prize-winning essays each examine the ill-fated American, British, Dutch, Australian command known as ABDA. Interestingly, I just had lunch with the uh, Indonesian defense minister last week. I had not thought about ABDA um, until I had read, uh, until I read uh, the essay on it um, by uh, by Andrew, uh, but the minister spoke of this of this uh, um, uh, of this command and how it was cobbled together. It ultimately didn't do so well, but um, he talked about those types of uh, interesting um, alliances in the Pacific. ABDA was a Supreme Allied Command. It was formed just in the wake of the Pearl Harbor attack, which lasted less than two months. Mr. Andrew Blakely suggests that the command failed for a number of reasons, all tied to a lack of unity. Multinational force elements had, had never previously worked together. They spoke different languages, and they operated within very different military cultures. 
ABDA's reactive efforts to cobble together a combined force with an ad hoc strategy were doomed to fail, and in hindsight, it's no surprise that that coalition was short-lived. As Mr. Blackley suggests, the future success of combined operations will depend on the planning and integration we can establish before we fight. Lieutenant Craig also sees ABDA command as an object lesson for future conflict in the Pacific. And, is, and he makes the case for a new American, British, Japanese, Australian, or ABJA unified command prior to conflict to allow us regular integrated high-end warfighting exercises across the Pacific while strengthening staff linkages and synchronizing national war plans. Multinational high-end combat, he warns, is not a pickup game, and he will get no argument from any of us. It's interesting, we did our Rim of the Pacific exercise this summer, and it's exactly one of the takeaways that we had, ABJA, that we needed to take, we needed to look for, to institutionalize some of those coalitions in the Indo-Pacific so we could take advantage of them, not just during uh, biannual exercises, but on a continuing basis. So, as you can see, this year's award winners have done some terrific work. These essays have certainly stimulated our thinking, and I know they would have, will advance the broader strategic conversations we are having throughout our maritime services and across our nation. And the timing could not be better. Our president has just released our new national security strategy, and it is clear we are now in the early years of a decisive decade for America and the world. This is a decade in which the terms of geopolitical competition between the major powers will be set. I believe that the terms of this competition will have maritime characteristics as the principal field of competition will be the sea. And when I see the talent in today's award winners, I am optimistic as ever about the future of our maritime force and the future of our nation. As a predecessor of mine, the 16th CNO, Admiral George W. Anderson once said, the Navy has both a tradition and a future. We should look with pride and confidence in both directions. Thank you all. And now let's get on with presenting the awards. Good morning, everyone. I'm Eric Mills, Editor-in-Chief of Naval History Magazine. I join my distinguished guests in saying to our winners and their families gathered here, heartfelt congratulations. There was some stiff competition in this year's contest, so to make it through the final rounds and ultimately prevail is something of which you can be rightly proud. So without further fanfare, let's get to the main event, shall we? The presenting of the prizes. First up, the professional historian category. Second prize this year goes, again, to Andrew Blackley for an object lesson on allied interoperability, the failure of the ABDA command 1942, a timely piece, as Admiral Gilday mentioned. Andrew, please come on up. So I've been asked to make this very brief, and I'll do that. Uh, Admiral Gilday did an outstanding job of summarizing my essay. I only want to add that it was inspired by his 2020 document, Advantage at Sea. And that and an important statement in that is that one of the main uh, advantages that the United States enjoys over its potential uh, adversaries is, in fact, our alliances, historic alliances, and our present alliances, and our relationships with other uh, liberal democracies in the world, and uh, who are going to, who individually have relationships with us to uh, protect and defend uh, the international liberal world, world order. But the point of my article was that looking at a historic precedent that 
it's dangerous to wait, as he said, to the last minute and do something ad hoc. It has to be done and planned well in advance. So it's my hope that uh, using the Indo-Pacific Com as a template, that uh, that will happen. Uh, and I'm, I'm, from what his remarks today, it makes me very um, much more optimistic that that will, in fact, happen. Uh, and again, I just would like to thank uh, Admiral Daly, Admiral Cox, uh, the, uh, the History and Heritage Command and, and the Naval Institute for, for doing this, and I thank you very much. Next up, first prize, professional historian category. This year goes to Lieutenant Colonel Peter Owen, U.S. Marine Corps retired. For Marine Aviation in the Pacific War, the right tool to support the, the fleet, but seldom the landing force. This is a good one, folks. I'm editing it for the next issue as we speak. Come on up. Thank you. Good morning, and I'd like to extend my sincere appreciation to Admiral Gilday, Admiral Cox, and Naval History Heritage Command, and uh, Admiral Daly, and the whole Naval Institute, and of course, General Dynamics. I also need to acknowledge the support and encouragement of my supervisor at the Royal Military College, Captain Arthur Galoxon, to Marine Corps historian Annette Ammerman at the DODPI. Uh, POW MIA um, Accounting Agency, and of course, uh, my lovely wife, Elena. Um, for the past century, the Marine Corps has insisted that its aircraft exist to support guys on the ground like I was. My article argues that in World War II, Marine aviation primarily supported the fleet at sea, not landing forces ashore. This argument is at the very center of my dissertation, and I chose this topic because I wanted to do something that I thought would be relevant to the naval services today, and, uh, and this honor kind of suggests that I'm on the right track here. Um, in 2018, General Berger, who was my company commander at 2nd Recon Battalion, announced that rather than assaulting islands and fighting insurgents, uh, our mid-21st century fleet marine force will fight from the land with the fleet to control the sea. In his Commandant's planning guidance, he actually said that during World War II, we clearly understood that Marines operate in support of the, operated in support of the Navy's sea control mission. This focus on sea control echoes the role marine aviation fulfilled during the Second World War. Nearly 100 marine squadrons spent five times as much time supporting the fleet as they spent supporting landing forces, both Army and Marine. This was not, in my argument, a misuse of these squadrons. Marine aviation, rather, was a flexible tool that naval commanders employed to operate inside contested airspace from austere airfields and hit targets ashore, aloft, and at sea. Marine aviation was the right tool for a tough job that the fleet needed done. Now, I understand that retired generals and defense analysts have urged caution as the Corps divests elements of the air ground team that has served the nation so well since 1950. And as the Corps refocuses on supporting the fleet in great power maritime competition and conflict, clearly understanding marine aviation's historic role as a land-based fleet air component may prove instruction. Thanks very much. Come we now to the rising historian category. Third prize goes to Lieutenant Kyle Craig, U.S. Navy, for avoiding ABDA comms annihilation. Lessons for today from 1942. Lieutenant, come on down. Good morning. My name is Lieutenant Kyle Craig, and I'm so honored to be here, not only for this award, uh, but for this day in naval history and as a SWO this very morning, 78 years ago, Ernest Evans, the crew of Johnston, and the tin can sailors of Taffy 3 were fighting like battleships 
in the Battle of Samar. It's a very special day, not only for this event, but uh, for the example they set for us so many years ago. I want to thank Admiral Gilday, uh, Admiral Buck for the Naval Academy, and Admiral Cox for your presence and support of this event, and those from your teams. Uh, to the Naval Institute, um, through your prior publishing, you helped me reach this point. Thank you so much, Admiral Daly, Captain Bill Hamlet, Jenny Pompey, and so many others. Most especially thank you to my family, who has supported my slow and professional writing career with inestimable patience and grace. The synopsis of my piece was described, but I ultimately attempt to tell the story of the months before and after that date, which lives in infamy through the eyes of some of our American, British, Dutch, and Australian leaders. To their credit, these men at the political, strategic, and operational levels saw the world as it was, with a repressive and revanchist, under-resourced and over-leveraged authoritarian regime. One that was willing to gamble with war in the wake of comprehensive American export controls against the critical resources necessary for their growth. Many of these men saw the possibility of war in the Pacific as a question of when rather than if, and that when it came, the coalition would need unity and command and effort. And we failed to achieve that initial unity in practice beyond maps or org charts. But I offer this story not to rebuke the men challenged in their own time, but so that we might learn through sweat that which they learned in blood. Consequently, I call for a standing coalition joint task force between the American, British, Japanese, and Australian allies today. As I return to a Pacific Fleet destroyer next year, I am confident a standing ABJA CJTF formed and stressed ahead of any Pacific conflict will help resolve the political and institutional frictions which ABDICOM experienced in 1942. Together, we must act to avoid the annihilation ABDICOM experienced, and just maybe we'll avoid the ignominy of a fait accompli over Taiwan. Thank you all for your time, and as a former Navy football player back on the yard, go Navy, beat Army. All right. Second prize rising historian category goes to Major Dustin Nicholson, U.S. Marine Corps, for some principles of littoral campaigns from the Solomons to the Falklands to today. As Admiral Gilday indicated, his father will be receiving his award. Thank you, sir. Now we come to the first prize in the Rising Historian category. It goes to Commander Matt Wright, U.S. Navy, for just-in-time production. Commander, come on down, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, Cino did a great job of summarizing my essay, better job than I, I would do. So I, I can use this time to, to say thank you. Thank you to Admiral Gilday, Admiral Daly, Admiral Cox. Thank you for putting on this, uh, this award. And I'm, I'm truly honored. Thank you for, for this honor. And I, I definitely need to say thank you to Caitlin, my, my beautiful wife up front there. She supports me in everything I do, including this, this odd habit of writing that I picked up. But specifically for this essay, she, she had several significant edits to what I thought was a final draft. So I can clearly say that I would not be up here if not for you, babe. Thanks. Um, my, my article, as summarized, was um, essentially looking at the, the three aircraft carriers that won the Battle of Midway. And not, not how they fought, but how they were purchased and built and used that as a, a symbol for the uh, rearmament, naval rearmament that the United States did just in time before World War II. And then I, then I attempted to draw some lessons forward to, to present day. Uh, and that was essentially how I approached the article. And, and the reason I wrote it was was for fun. I picked up an odd hobby, like I said, and I thought it'd be interesting to explore the, those concepts through writing, and, 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 I, and I did. Um, but the other reason why I wrote it, and the, the one thing I want to say today for sure, is because I felt comfortable writing this essay and, and others before it uh, because of the open forum that is fostered by people in this room, by the Naval Institute. So I, I would like to recognize that and say thank you. It's, it's, it's abnormal to have an open forum inside of a military organization. But I know that we're stronger for it, uh, and it's only because of your efforts and the support of our senior leadership that, uh, that it strengthens our Navy and our nation. So thank you. 
That thing is neat. Wow. Okay. Well, that's it, folks. Um, thank you for joining us for this. And um, I'd also like to say con uh, congratulations again to the winners. One more round of applause to them all, please.